All right, well, we'll try and get started now with people trickling from lunch. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Jing Lu. Uh, she's currently a third-year PhD student at Purdue University. Uh, she also received her master's degree in 2013 in agricultural meteorology from Purdue. Um, and so her advisor is Dev Niyogi. And back in 2015, they applied and received a DTC Visitor uh, Award. And so the work that she'll be presenting today is showing some of the work they've done in conjunction with that. Um, I should also mention that while she's been here, she's been working very closely with uh, Faye Chen and Mike Barlash um, in RAP. And so today, uh, Jing will be talking about uh, introducing dynamic crack growth into the NOAA MP land surface model and some of the different uh, development and applications she's been doing with that. So uh, I'd like to introduce Jing. Thanks. Can you hear me clear from here? Okay. So it's a, such an honor to be here, see this play, right? <laughs> okay, and uh, I come to Boulder every summer since 2014, every summer. So I really, like, so I really, really like Boulder. And Michelle told me last week it will be 45 minutes. I was so nervous. I'm like, 45 minutes longer than a PhD dissertation. But I didn't know this one gonna be recorded. So next year I just play this one in my defense, then I'm done. <laughs> Okay, thank you for attending this crop stuff. I know a lot of you don't do too much work about crop, but I will tell you my work is also part of my PhD dissertations. So today I'm going to talk about uh, introducing dynamic crop growth in the non p lens model and talk about some development also applications. And this is the outline of my presentation. So basically background development then some offline results, and we finished some coupling results last week. And finally, I'll talk about the potential applications from this model. And firstly, why we need lens models. This messy figure from Mike Ake, it's a, from the perspective from lens modeler. So you can see the lower boundary of lens model is the only physical boundary for the atmos atmo atmospheric models. And in WOF, the non P gamma provide the surface sensitive heat flux, latent heat flux, also the long wave radiation, and upward short wave radiation, also some surface momentum exchange coefficient. And why we talk about cropland in the limestone modeling? So every summer when I drove from Indiana to uh, Colorado, all I say is corn, 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 and sometimes solving corn and solving because this part is majorly you call U.S. corn belt. It's provide more than 90% um, global supply for corn and also contribute more than 30 billion uh, for U.S. economy. And also if you fly from Chicago to Boulder, I took this picture, uh, you can see uh, that one is uh, in Middle West area. Majorly this cropland is rain phase, so it's square, square, and when you past Nebraska, you're gonna see the circle, it's irrigation. So the point is, we have so many croplands on the globe, it's more than, how many? More than 13% of the globe is covered by cropland. And at the same time, we only have 3% is urban area. But we, we, focus so, we have so much, so much focus on urban area, but we're kind of ignoring the cropland. So in our project, we think it's very important for us to and consider it equally for cropland as well as urban area too. And besides that, you can see some studies, this one is a recently one published in Nature Climate Change. So they find the cropland intensity is relevant to the cooling effects in the Middle West, especially for extreme high temperatures. And also in current wolf versions, we found that during summer the, crop, the wolf model tends to provide warmer temperatures than the observations. So we think it's probably because they're relevant to the cropland and also this cooling effects, which, which results the um, bias from the wolf model. So from our, from our perspective is our project, the objective is to including the uh, feedback from crop with atmospheric, including the above ground, also underground, to see the interactions between root soil interactions, also the leaf um, boundary interactions, and also including some field management in the model, because they also find that irrigation has cooling effects to the atmosphere too. And also, 
other uh, management factor, including planting and harvesting. Because the, the special thing about cropland is it is natural, but it's not 100% natural because heavily uh, rely on the human activities. So when, when did you decide planting? And then when did you decide harvesting? Because for, for example, for the harvesting, if you, after the harvesting, the landscape just dramatically changed. Nothing, nothing actually left on the ground. So I think it's very important to uh, incorporating its management in the landscape model too. And this way, the Mali's globe land cover for mostly uh, lens model as an input, also for wolf input. So you can see for the in the Mali's land cover, the only for the crop they only have one cover type, and the major crop area is in the U.S., Brazil, Russia, China, India, and part of Australia. So for the model itself, it knows where its crop, but it doesn't know which crop it is. So it we process this new map, new global uh, crop cover map. There are 42, uh, 42 crops. So you can see in the U.S. majorly covered by corn, and in Brazil, soybean. Also in Russia, it's wheat, majorly winter wheat. And we all know that corn, soybean, and the winter wheat, they are very different in terms of the growing season and uh, the peak, the peak value of AOI. So. And it's very important to let the model know what crop it is and when the crop starts to grow. And also, this one, uh, the upper uh, graph is the prescribed LI for mostly uh, non P models. That one is for all the crops. So in the models, no matter what kind of crop it is, the OAI is just uh, started from the uh, April and the end of in September. And the, Peak, peak value is just three, so it's really from the table. But however, in the reality is that one just made soybean and wheat. The AOI is very different, so different time to grow, and they reach the peak and different time too. So as a summary, the limitations of current AOSMs is in simulating cropland. Firstly, it only have single crop cover, and its length of dynamic simulations, no matter is upper ground and also underground of the dynamic routing depths too. And also, it, it doesn't have the field management considered in the model. And one more thing is, it's very important for original crop modeling because when, when I do my masters, I work a lot with crop models. So we're trying to get the original crop modeling results, which are going to provide the model results for the agricultural models. Then they were doing that one with some food security issues. But when I run the models, lots of models are not open source, and they're only designed to running for a site specific. So when you run the model, you have to download data from NCDC, then convert it to the required format for the crop model, then use another third party uh, software to automatically to drive the model. So it's very, very time consuming, and it's, there are so many missing data when you come in data. So for regional crop modeling, uh, if we can save the time to provide a more higher resolution, uh, uh, regional crop modeling products very important for agriculture community too. So this figure is from a, a global project called ECMIN. Probably some of you heard about it. So their goal is to get a uh, regional crop modeling that provide to agriculture economic models than to assess, assess future uh, agricultural productions. So in these figures, you can see that one here. So they're going to evaluate how future climate impacts food, uh, crop productions. But it's like the interactions, the feedback from how cropland uh, influence the future climate change. So our uh, um, project objective here is just to, we're going to combine one p with uh, crop modeling, then got a new model called non-P crop. So from non-P crop, it's going to couple with WOLF with a goal to improve the performance from WOLF in, in short-term and seasonal forecasting. And also, it's going to provide a higher resolution regional crop modeling products for agriculture applications and uh, other research. And we have four tasks here. The first one is the development of the NP crop model. Then we're going to integrate new crop cover maps into herd us as offline mode. And also going to assess the impacts from the dynamic crop growth and also the new cover maps uh, on the crop yield, uh, crop yield uh, simulations. 
So following tests will be assessing the impacts of crop atmospheric detections on weather focusing in the couple mode. And the technical flow is model, de model development, then calibration and, and validation and both field scale and regional scale. Then finally going to have some couple studies. So this way in the uh, model framework, basically you're going to have three group inputs, weather, soil, and land cover, and running in one P. So right now in one P they have three options. One is uh, most normally one is pre-scribed -pre table AI. Another one is the uh, old uh, original, it's a very generic dynamic vegetation option. Right now we're adding the new ones called MP crop. So in the MP crop, it's going to have the crop modeling module and also the new crop land cover maps and also the plant, new planting dates and harvesting dates maps. And we also add a uh, cultivar selections in the new model too. So the output, besides the original one, including the energy output, water and carbon, right now we add one more for the agriculture, uh, agriculture community specifically, its yield and GDD. So GDD is growing degree days. It's very common. It's a very common term to use in agriculture area. We use that one to um, assess what kind of cultivar you're going to use for this area, and use that one to evaluate what stage this crop grows to. And this is the model framework. Basically, you give the model a planting date, then it's turn on the planting index, then start it start start to calculate the growing degree days. Then based on the growing degree days, the model going to have on A stages, and based on the A stages of the crop, they have different allocation scheme for the carbon hydrate. And then the carbon hydrate after turnover, turn, turnover deaths and respirations, it's going to allocate to different parts of the crop. Then from leaf mass, we calculate the LAI, that one is the feedback from the whole model. And from the root mass, we're going to calculate the uh, rooting depths, the heavy interactions with the uh, rooting depths with the soil moisture. And for the uh, new land cover map, for the U.S., we use the uh, USDA CropScape. It's a product uh, combined with survey data and uh, remote sensing data, too. And for a global map, we use the, um, the SPARM data. It is a combination of model results and uh, survey data from different global organizations. So this one, the planning dates map, well, we use a planning this map from USDA survey data and the state level. So you can see from from the figure that um, the planning dates is varies from 90, in the 95th day to the 130 days. So probably they're going to have a more than a month difference to planting the different crops. And also this one in the growing degree map. We calculate the growing degree maps based on uh, the survey, the growing season lens at different area. So based on growing degree days, it's going to give the model some information about which kind of corn you're going to select. Because different corn, they have different growing season to fit for different regions. And this one is the research area and data source. So for the field scale, we have the data from Bonwell and me in Nebraska. It's both Ameriflex data set. And also for the 2D regional scale, we're going to have, uh, we focus on U.S. corn belt and data source from NODAS2 and NAR. The data, the yield observation data we, we connect from the USDA NAS, that one is National Agriculture Statistics Center. And this is a uh, uh, field scale. So for the field scales, uh, I think the results are pretty good because it's capture the AI and also leaf mass, stir mass, and the model is able to provide your yield mass right now. And the model is also able to capture the annual variability between 2001, 2000, uh, 2003, and 2005. This is AI. And as I said before, right now the model is able to simulate the core and soybean. So the soybean is from me side. So as I said before, if you see the two figures, you can see the core and soybean, they are different in terms of how, how, how large the LI reached to during the peak season and also when the LI reached to peak. You see, you see the, uh, in, for core, it's reached to peak uh, in the middle of July, and for the soybean, it's reached to peak in the middle of August. So the model right now can differentiate difference between different crops.
and if you see it's one in the simple heat flux and latent heat flux. So for simple heat flux model has a very significant improvement in the early growing incidence. So the green, the red line is the model results, the blue that's the observations. And the black line is a um, original dynamic vegetation and the green line is a pre prescribed AOI flow model. So you can see the original dynamic and they kind of they kind of like lower for the simple heat flux in the early May, and also tend to higher in July. But for the latent heat flux, the model seems don't have very uh, obvious um, improvement for latent heat flux, but still have slightly improvement. And that is probably because we haven't we're going to, but we haven't including the dynamic routing depths into the model. Because right now, the model and all other lines of models for the uh, rooting depth for corn, uh, for crops, they also have the fixed rooting depth as one meters. So for the, in the model, the, the rooting depth is never changed and it's always staying in one meter from the day one to day 300. That is probably the reason you didn't, you didn't see very obvious uh, improvement here in this model. And this one in the soil moisture also uh, all the three model options, they have very similar results in simulating soil moisture, but they do capture the trend when it have rain, the soil moisture do have, do, do, in, do increase the values. That is also probably due to the lack of root, uh, root dynamics in the model too. And for the regional scale offline runs, we focus on the U.S. corn belt too. That one in the uh, NCDC U.S. corn belt climate zone. And we choose three years from 2012, 2013, and 2014. We choose these three years because 2012 is very dry, and 2013 is uh, considered as a normal year, and 2014 is a little bit wetter than 2013. And this one in the model with us, so from uh, in the right, in my right hand, that one is the LOI, how the LOI increased from the day 115, it's like early May, then to the uh, to August. And this one, the, how the grains, which is the yield, increased during the day 180 to the day 290. So if you see, the, it's, the grains kind of uh, starting to grow from south, move to north, then su suddenly go to black because they have a harvesting index in the model. So when you see it's empty because we harvest uh, the grain in the model. And also, this is the uh, some offline results too. So in my left side, that one is the observations um, for the corn yield in 2012 and 2013 and 2014. So you can say 2012, uh, it's very dry, so they don't have too much corn yield. And 2013 and 2014 very similar. So in the model, in the model, you can see also it kind of captured the uh, impact from the drought too. So the uh, the warmer color is uh, lower yield, the green color is higher yield. So 2012 in the model also very obviously lower than the model product in 2013. So this result is pretty, I'm pretty happy about this result because I running a lot of crop model before, it's really hard for the model actually to capture the influence for drought and original scale. So I'm happy that no one pea crop can capture its drought impact. And this one, give you some information about how important to uh, incorporating the management information. So in the right side, that one we're running the model was using just a single planting date and also single cultivable information. You can see the model has a good performance around Lake Michigan because we develop we develop model user information there so it's had better performance than other parts, especially for the West in Nebraska. And then if we're including the management information here, the ratio, which is model uh, divided by the observations, the ratio has a, a great in improved uh, in the west part too. So it's very important as to, for us to add the planting dates and the cultivar selection in the model to add when you're doing the original running. And I'm going to show you some California results from here. This is, we just have the results from last week. So, still have a lot of things uh, not fully understand right now, but I just show you some very primary, 
pre preliminary results here, so we can discuss more later. And this one is the AOI from both 2012 and 2013. So 2012 is very dry, and 2013 is normal years. So you can see the 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 yellow line is from the crop model, and the blue line is from the 1P with using the modest AOI. Then realize uh, the 1P was using the old dynamic. And this one is the 1P table, and the black line is the noir model. Also use a, a prescribed AOI. So you can see that it's very obvious that noir P was using the old dynamic modules. It tend to have very early planting for the for the crop, but but for the crop models, things to some point very dry, so it seems the OI is pretty low in the model, and also the precipitation is very low in 2012. So that is why, that is probably because the model is very sensitive to the precipitation. So in 2012, the crop didn't seem to grow too well, and but if you see in 2013, the, the AOIs tend to back to a normal trend, which which to seven and eight in the peak season too. And this one in the little heat flux. So in 2012, because we have very low vegetation and very low AOI, so the model produced a very low little heat flux too. And in, 2013, uh, in 2013, all the model have very similar results in terms of simulating the little heat flux. And this one in the uh, and temperature, again, in 2012, because uh, we have lower little heat flux, so the model produces a higher sensible heat flux. So you say the model tend to provide a warmer temperature than observations. But in 2013, actually the crop model shows the best fit with the observations, because probably because they have they provide a very uh, um, a good a good vegetation index. So it's kind of lower the model results for the um, temperature. It's probably relevant to the cooling effects from the um, crop land too. And this one in the precipitation fractions. So in so in, in two thousand twelve the model produced very low precipitation compared lower precipitations compared with the um, observations. And in two thousand thirteen the model provided higher precipitations um, than the observations. So I'm not going to say it's because it had higher vegetation or in 2012, because it had lower vegetation, it's probably relevant, but we definitely need to work more on these results. Right now, still has lots of uh, part I don't fully understand. And the lesson we learned from this project is, first, it's very important for us to enhance the representation of crops in the LSM. And also, the, the as you see in my slides, to incorporate the specific management in the life's model, in term, no matter you're running that for the original crop modeling or for the warfare loss, it's very important because right now, as I know, for all the global model, when they have this, like COM or other model, when they have these crops, they tend to assume the crop cultivar is the same for the globe, which is, from my personal perspective, is very, it's contribute a large uncertainty in the model results too. And also the off the offline mode of this model show good performance, but the couple of rounds right now has mixed performance, so we definitely need to work more on the couple of rounds too. And the challenge for model, firstly, is how we're gonna calibrate the model and the validation of the model, because how to get the good observation for the validation is also a big a problem too. And Mike mentioned that DTC had the the validation package. I forgot, I forgot the name for Wolf. So I definitely want to use it's called Matt or something. Yeah, because we want to use that one to uh, validate the model results too. So some potential applications for the non P crop model. Firstly, is couple Wolf and crop, and the improve maybe improve the season and short term with the focusing. And it's definitely gonna have some um, uh, contribute to the signal crop yield forecasting, also the real time crop simulating. Because that, that part to um, the signal forecasting and real time um, crop simulating is talked by the agriculture community like for a really, really long time. Because everybody wants to run the model and real time. Otherwise, that makes sense to have crop model. Because 
if we talk to a farmer, use our model, farm, he will say, why? Why we use a model if we don't have a single forecasting in the model? So if we can use a non p crop in the agriculture community, it's going to, I think it has really good potential in using a model in the agriculture community, too. And for the offline mode, we can use a model for the regional agroclimatic assessments, also the rural on soil moisture simulations. Because right now, uh, although we have SMAP, SMAP or LMAS, they provide you the uh, rural on soil moisture, but the model they use to simulate the rural on soil moisture also length of crop and also length of uh, dynamic rooting depth in the model. So maybe we can provide a, a better simulations when you assimilate this map surface so much, so much data into the rural so much soil moisture too. And for the future, uh, for the non P crop, actually I just present a framework here. So we can add more crops or we can, and or we can add more management. And if we, uh, Combine this model with Wolf Hydro, which is the next step. We're going to have a, a better irrigation scheme right now. And also, it's going to be combined, provide the output for the economic models. And if we're going to get the data from digital soil mapping, which can provide a better soil information for the model, too. And also, as I said before, the SMAP and LMS. And that's it. So, thank you for DTC to support me. Uh, the two summers in Boulder, which is wonderful. And also thank Michelle as my host and forgive me to forget our meeting twice. <laughs> <laughs> and also thank Michelle, uh, we're Maribeth's not here, and thank you Maribeth for dealing with my annoying requests all the time. <laughs> and also you can download the model right now and the raw uh, website and uh, the paper we submitted and got a minor revision two days ago, so it should be published soon. And the wolf, wolf crop, I don't know when it will be released, probably next time, like next September or May, maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't really sure about that part. And uh, if you have any uh, in questions or you want more information about the model, feel free to email me. Thanks. It's 45. Okay, do you have any question? Yes. I'm curious as to how you integrate um, irrigation information into the model. Because uh, irrigation, it's a really good question. Right now, all the, model, all, the, all the other model, they have irrigation. So that one just very simple equation because if the soil moisture below the uh, deficit, so you just add water to the soil the, and they they don't have the information about where the water comes from so it's not conserved then what, what we want to do is we're gonna add the uh, uh, wolf hydro the water network and also we're writing to model so we're gonna know where, where, where we can we take the water and where the water gonna go so it can be very simple to very complex depends on what you want to do but we want to do a more like more real one instead of a very simple Equation the model. Yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a Thanks. pleasure to have you visit us, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Yeah. And when is your last day here? Uh, 27th? 27th. Yeah. Oh, and I should mention she's an FL2. Oh, what's your cubicle number? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody, I can e email yeah, me and I can. 2032 you know. something? I know it changed a few times. So, all right. But anyways, um, she'll be here for another couple of weeks. So if you have any more yeah. questions or want to follow up, she'll be around. Thanks. Thank you very much.